April 1st, 2001. An American EP-3E electronic signals reconnaissance aircraft was struck by a Chinese J-8 fighter while on a routine mission 70 miles south of Hainan Island, China. The Chinese pilot is killed and the American plane with a crew of 24 is severely damaged but still able to stay in the air. Its pilot, Lt. Shane Osborne, makes a decision to fly north to Hainan Island to make an emergency landing. The Chinese do not respond to his request to land, but Lt. Osborne successfully lands the aircraft at an airfield on the island anyway. The crew is detained and the Chinese refuse to give the aircraft back, sparking an international incident that proved to be the first major foreign policy test for President George W. Bush just two and a half months into his presidency. In this video, I plan to go over the details of the incident, the steps taken to resolve the crisis, and its impact from a military and diplomatic standpoint. First, let's go over the incident in detail. On April 1st, the EP-3 was one of 11 in service with the U.S. Navy. It was scheduled to take off from Kandena Air Base in Okinawa, Japan, and the plan was to fly a reconnaissance route that was fairly common at this point. They would fly between Taiwan and the Philippines before turning towards the Chinese coast near Hong Kong and following it around to Hainan Island. The aircraft's mission was a simple signals intelligence mission, one of which the United States operate often using EP-3s, sometimes well over 200 a year. The aircraft carried the latest and greatest equipment to accomplish its mission, including numerous computers chock full of highly classified encryption and decryption material. Shortly before 5 a.m., the aircraft took off on what was scheduled to be a nine-hour long flight. The aircraft eventually settled in around 22,000 feet at a speed of approximately 220 miles per hour. Due to the frequency of the flights, China had made a habit of running inspection flights every so often. Chinese aircraft would approach and fly close to the EP-3s, and this behavior is not uncommon. The U.S. does the same thing to Russian flights that approach the West Coast, and Russia does the same to American flights that get close to Russian territory. China, in fact, had conducted 44 such inspection flights since December of 2000. Around 8.48 a.m., the EP-3 was to the south of Hainan Island when the Chinese scrambled two J-8 fighters from Ling Shui Airfield. The J-8s are based on the Soviet MiG-21 and have a max ceiling of 60,000 feet and can reach up to Mach 2.2 or nearly 1,700 miles per hour. With these speeds in mind, it didn't take long for the jets to catch up to the EP-3 traveling significantly slower. At 8.55, the J-8s were spotted approaching the aircraft. And at this point, the aircraft were 70 miles south of Hainan Island, near the end of the EP-3's flight plan. One of the J-8s approached from the 3 o'clock side of the EP-3 and closed to within 10 to 20 feet of the plane, before backing off and moving to the left side of the aircraft and closing distance again to less than 10 feet before backing off. On third pass by, the J-8 was directly below the EP-3's left outermost engine. The jet was unable to maneuver out from this position and subsequently impacted the propeller of the EP-3, shearing the tail off of the J-8 before the jet then crashed into the front of the EP-3, knocking off its nose cone. The left aileron of the EP-3 was also damaged and forced fully upright, causing the plane to roll to its left. Debris from the impact peppered the aircraft, as well as causing the decompression of the aircraft's cabin. The EP-3 was now inverted and descending rapidly. As for the J-8, it too began a rapid descent and its pilot managed to eject, but their parachute never deployed and their body was never found. The EP-3 was now in a violent descent and Lt. Osborne made the announcement to prepare to bail out. After descending 14,000 feet, or over 2.5 miles in just minutes, Osborne was finally able to get the crippled aircraft under control. A mayday was issued, and Osborne began weighing his options to save his crew. He ultimately decided to fly north to Hainan Island to attempt to land, figuring it was the best option to save all 24 crew members. He then gave the order to begin destroying all the classified and highly sensitive material on board the aircraft. 
China never answered any of the plane's mayday calls, and after making a pass over the airfield, Osborne successfully landed the aircraft. They were surrounded by Chinese soldiers before being escorted off the plane. Unfortunately, the crew failed to destroy all the sensitive material on board, and the effects of which I will cover shortly. Within hours, the Bush administration began working to get the crew home as well as bring the plane back under U.S. control. The crew was interrogated by the Chinese, seeking whatever information they could. In an interview with PBS after the incident, Lt. Osborne reported that they used sleep deprivation techniques and verbal threats when interrogating him, but never resorted to any physical torture. Brigadier General Neil Seelock, the defense attaché based in Beijing, was able to meet with the crew three days after the incident. The crew were in the same clothes they landed in and had not been able to bathe. General Seelock's mission was simple to assess the status of the U.S. crew and start working to bring them home. On April 3rd, President Bush addressed the American people to inform them of the good condition of the crew and that the U.S. expected the crew and aircraft to be returned. The crew's release became conditional upon receiving a letter of apology for the incident from the United States. A letter was issued via the U.S. Ambassador to China, Joseph Pruer, but it did not apologize for the incident per se, and it reads as follows. Dear Mr. Minister, on behalf of the United States government, I now outline steps to resolve this issue. Both President Bush and Secretary of State Powell have expressed their sincere regret over your missing pilot and aircraft. Please convey to the Chinese people and to the family of pilot Wang Wei that we are very sorry for their loss. Although the full picture of what transpired is still unclear, according to our information, our severely crippled aircraft made an emergency landing after following international emergency procedures. We are very sorry the entering of China's airspace and the landing did not have verbal clearance, but very pleased the crew landed safely. We appreciate China's efforts to see to the well-being of our crew. In view of the tragic incident and based on my discussions with your representative, we have agreed to the following actions. Both sides agree to hold a meeting to discuss the incident. My government understands and expects that our air crew will be permitted to depart China as soon as possible. The meeting would start April 18, 2001. The meeting agenda will include discussion of the causes of the incident, possible recommendations whereby such collisions could be avoided in the future, development of a plan for prompt return of the EP-3 aircraft, and other related issues. We acknowledge your government's intention to raise U.S. reconnaissance missions near China in the meeting. Sincerely, Joseph W. Pruer. The day after this letter was issued, the 24 men and women still detained in China were released after being held for 11 days. They took a charter flight to Guam before boarding a military aircraft bound for Hawaii. After getting to Hawaii, the crew was debriefed for two full days about the events that transpired, and on April 14th, a public press conference was held. Lieutenant Osborne would later be awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for his actions. The crew was home, but their aircraft was still in Chinese hands. The U.S. was in the midst of an arms deal with Taiwan that complicated negotiations to get the aircraft back. After three months, China finally agreed to return the plane but it was not allowed to be repaired and flown from Hainan Island. It had to be disassembled and then flown in pieces on board other aircraft. It was finally released on July 3, 2001, three months after the original incident. The plane was ultimately repaired and eventually returned to service. As a result of the incident, U.S. surveillance flights became less and less frequent, only returning to pre-incident levels in 2011. The bigger issue for the United States was the intelligence haul China gained. Despite the crew's best efforts, they failed to destroy the majority of the classified materials on board before landing. This was partly due to the confusion of the incident and a lack of clear protocols on how to dispose of classified materials on board the aircraft when an emergency occurs. What intelligence did China gain from the aircraft? Well, among the information the plane carried, it included multiple computers whose hard drives were still intact. Some of this information included the Martez suite of software tools for collecting, analyzing, and processing various signals. There was also the Raisin, 
or radio signals notation, which included a manual and the Raisin working aid that contained every signal that the United States was tracking and collecting in China, Russia, North Korea, and others. And it gets worse. In addition to these, there was also the pro forma signals information as well. This is weapons related signals and the aircraft carried the data of over 50 nations on it. There is also a 15 hour period where China could decrypt and read all communications in the Pacific Theater due to access to the EP3's code books. It was also revealed to the Chinese which of their codes had been broken by the United States. Most notably, the fact that the U.S. had been able to track their ballistic missile submarines communications and locations. With this knowledge, China, of course, would work to establish new codes and processes to conceal their communications. In addition to all of this, they also gained access to the physical equipment used to collect all of this information. This massive blow to U.S. intelligence led to criticism of the pilot, Lt. Shane Osborne, for not ditching the aircraft to protect the valuable and highly classified materials on board. The intelligence turned over to China did allow them to put the U.S. back in the dark about much of their activities and revealed to many of America's adversaries just how much we knew about them. The alternative, had Osborne ditched the aircraft, these secrets will have remained just that. Secrets. But that alternative also presented a greater risk of losing some, if not all, of the 24 crew members. The average temperature of the South China Sea in April is between 68 and 74 degrees Fahrenheit. While this is survivable, it can still be dangerous as temperatures as high as 60 degrees Fahrenheit is considered immediately life-threatening. There's also the risk of crew members becoming trapped within the aircraft while ditching. The damage to the plane meant that the plane would not remain on the surface very long as water rushed in. But ultimately, Lt. Osborne made the decision that gave his crew the best chance of surviving the ordeal, valuing their lives over the material within. The incident was a major test for the new Bush administration, and for all intents and purposes, they passed that test and managed to save face. The September 11th attacks would push the incident to the point of being forgotten by the public as America faced a new threat in the beginning of a major war in Afghanistan. I hope you found this video informative about this seemingly forgotten moment in US-China relations. Let me know if there's anything you think I missed and I've included my sources in the description as well so be sure to give them a look for the more detailed information. Please be sure to leave a like on the video and you can find me on Twitter at Today's History 13 and with that I'll see you on the next one.